thank you. And thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm the son of a bookseller, so I would like to sell some. Otherwise, my late father will be unhappy with me. He used to say that any fool can write them. The genius is to sell them. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for coming. Um, this is kind of an accidental book. This is not a book I planned to write. This is not a book I had ever wanted to write. Um, uh, this is maybe the one of the few books I wrote I really felt I had to write. It was written not in the relatively leisurely pace historical books are usually written, um, but it was written in a frenzy of a few months over the summer. Um, when I asked my boss, the dean, to do without me for a little while. He said, yeah, as long as it's in the summer, that's OK, uh, when everybody's on leave anyway. Um, this book was really prompted. It was prompted by my shock uh, at the uh, full scale war breaking out uh, in Russia uh, and my disbelief in, in what was going on and my uh, plain horror at what had happened in the country uh, Russia, but also the country I studied for much of my adult life uh, and uh, what it did to the country, which I got very interested in um, since about 2016 or so, um, or 2015 probably. Um, and it began as a, it didn't began as a book really, it began as a series of articles and op-eds and so on. And then at some point I was approached by uh, Melbourne University Press who said we need to publish a book on this and you should write it because my first reaction was oh I could recommend some really good authors and everybody looked at me a little bit funny um, so it is very much uh, the title of course is misleading as titles often are nothing is ever a whole story this is also provocation of course it is trying to say there's a lot of stories about this war and the background history of this war, which are misleading, incomplete, and sometimes outrightly false. So I was trying to do my best in a relatively short volume to set the record straight. Um, I also tried to keep footnotes to a minimum, but as critics pointed out, I didn't really succeed because um, there's still too many of them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what's in the book and then we can can have a conversation uh, about the broader thing. Um, this is really a prehistory of this war. It, it does tell you a little bit of a, a, a potted history of the first couple of months of this war, uh, but it's not really a history of the war itself. It's a history of the, it's a prehistory and it's a very deep prehistory. It goes back to the late middle ages not because I think this is an ancient ethnic conflict, they always hated each other and so on, but because both sides trace their own histories back so far. And that's where a lot of the disinformation and misinformation and partial history begins. That's why I needed to go back there. I don't think this is terribly relevant in terms of modern Russia and modern Ukraine, um, but then I'm a historian of the 20th century and not a medievalist, right? Okay, so here's the table of contents. You see it is a, um, a parallel history of contemporary Russia and contemporary Ukraine. How did we get to these uh, countries uh, in the first four chapters? And then uh, there's two chapters about the more immediate um, genesis of the war and one optimistically called the future in which this is probably the least typical kind of thing because historians usually refuse to talk about the future um, that's not what we have every, any evidence for right so what I do there in the in the future one is to develop some scenarios uh, about where this war uh, could go and we're still um in some of the, I mean, most of them are still possible um, at the moment. You see also that I uh, 
deliberately start this history with the history of Ukraine rather than the history of Russia, because I wanted to get away from a tendency in my field to tell the history of Ukraine as a kind of a sub-history of Russia. And that is because much of English language and German language as well, uh, historiography on Russia has been uh, written by Russian emigres, many of whom were they mostly were liberals, but were also imperialists. Uh, so they actually embraced the the imperial history uh, of uh, the Russian Empire, uh, and that's the kind of history of Russia most of us uh, grew up with, including myself. Um, so I tell this history in four chapters. First, a very kind of broad chapter, which gets you from medieval Rus to uh, independent Ukraine in 1991 then a similar one for Russia uh, for that, and then uh, more detailed two chapters uh, on which is where the real prehistory in a, in a way of this war starts uh, on uh, the divergence of the historical paths of Ukraine and Russia uh, since 1991. Uh, then I uh, add a somewhat polemical chapter on the chief decision maker in this um, in this whole mess, which is Vladimir Putin. Okay, so the history, this is the kind of history of the region which used to be the Soviet Union, most of us grew up with. It's a Russian history, right? So there's the the, the origin, most Russian historians, actually all Russian historians trace their country and its culture back to the medieval Rus, a a country uh, which was a conglomerate of principalities run by uh, by the Rurik dynasty. They came from, they were Norsemen, they were Vikings, right? Came from, uh, from uh, the north uh, on the way to Byzantium and found essentially Kiev as a good place uh, to stop for a while and then they stayed. Um, this is where uh, the East Slavs became Christians. Um, and this is where a lot of the initial uh, cultural formation of East Slavs, that is, um, in this case in particular, uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians uh, took place. Um, that society was, well, if not destroyed, but uh, subjugated by the Mongols, uh, and the old center of, of that uh, culture, Kiev, um, became less important, and there's new centers emerging, and one of these centers was Moscow, which then, of course, becomes uh, eventually the Russian Empire and starts to dominate not just the space uh, uh, of the old Rus, but much, much broader uh, part of Eurasia, becomes the, the, the largest land empire since the Mongols, uh, an extremely successful early modern empire. Uh, and the, the importance of empire will come uh, back to. Uh, this then breaks apart in the in uh, World War I, but gets reconstituted as the Soviet Union, which essentially has the same kind of real estate and so on. So Ukraine sort of you know comes in and out of that history at some points. Uh, but that's the history and until the Soviet Union breaks apart and then you suddenly have Ukraine and Russia. So that's one of the non-whole non stories, right? Uh, because if you are a Ukrainian national historian, you tell the history totally differently. Um, uh, you tell a history of the formation of Ukraine. Now, in difference, oh, and I'm not going to go back to the last slide because otherwise we confuse the, the audience which is with us virtually. Um, uh, in, in, con in, in contrast to the Russian story, there is no continuity of statehood here. So the Russian empire from the, from the rise of Muscovy after the Mongol invasion has a continuous history of statehood, right? Uh, to the present day, um, with, of course, moments of interruption and, and, and chaos and so on. But um, there is a, a clear that the Russian state is something that can be identified as something that is uh, there. That's not so for uh, the southwest um, 
Sla uh, East Slavic lands, the Ukrainian lands, uh, as well as the Belarusian lands, um, because there's several states which are dominating that region. There are moments uh, of Ukrainian statehood, um, and we'll come back to those. Uh, but uh, so there's the Hetmanat uh, in uh, the middle of the 17th century. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there is a Ukrainian independent state uh, during the revolutionary period. Um, but otherwise, they are under uh, the Ukrainian lands and Ukrainian peoples uh, are under um, states which are not named after them, right? And the main states are Poland and Lithuania in the West and Russia in the East. Uh, and eventually Habsburg uh, as well um, after the divisions of Poland. So if we put the two of them together, we have this convoluted slide, right? And I'm trying to tell, and that is of course not, that is a terrible simplification, right? Um, of that history, uh, but it's already pretty convoluted. So what the first um, two chapters are trying to do is tell those parallels, the parallel story of the uh, East Ukraine and West Ukraine, uh, the, the East, the Ukrainian lands and the and the the, the Russian lands. Um, the important an important moment is that none of them, both Ukrainian national historians and Russian national historians, claim the Rus as their own but there is actually no continuity of statehood, right? There's, there's all kinds of cultural continuities in both directions, uh, but it is not that there was, you know, a uh, Russian state uh, in the medieval Rus, which then becomes Russia. There was uh, a uh, cultural entity and a political entity called the Rus. Um, and several parts of that culture develop in different ways in different parts uh, over the next centuries. And that's where you get a divergence of uh, Russian and Ukrainian um, history. Uh, the strong influence of Poland and Lithuania on the Ukrainian uh, history is very important. So for uh, 300 years, these lands were under uh, much, much more Western uh, influence. Uh, they absorbed some of the political culture of Poland. Uh, the uh, most towns were um, were uh, governed in in uh, in a style which we know from Germany, um, with self governance uh, essentially. Uh, this is where the Russian Orthodox Church goes through a, a counter reformation in in um, in parallel or in in copying what the Catholic Church does in reaction to the. Um, to the uh, uh, the Reformation. So there is a lot of things which happen in different ways on both uh, sides, but of course they influence each other. These, these are, th there's a lot of fluidity in uh, between them. So the, for the Ukrainian history, the three big moments uh, are the Hetmanat, which is a, a Cossack state. Um, in rebellion against the Polish overlords, um, and which is claimed today by Ukrainian historians as one of the first moments of Ukrainian statehood after, or the second moment actually, because they, they of course uh, identify with Rus as well. Um, this is also the moment when quite a big chunk of uh, Ukrainian lands come to the Russian empire because the Hetmanat makes a treaty uh, with the Tsardom of Russia, um, which the Cossacks think is essentially a military alliance and uh, the Muscovites think is a subjugation to the autocratic power of the Tsar. Uh, and that misunderstanding plays itself out for quite a while, but, but you know, bit by bit, the, the part of the country which the, of the Ukrainian lands uh, which come to uh, Moscow um, get integrated into the Russian Empire. And the self-governance of the of the uh, of the um, Cossacks gets more and more eroded until it's essentially gone. Um, now, it's sometimes denied that this might be Ukrainian. Of course, one can quibble about whether or not um, this is really the country which we now understand as Ukraine. Uh, but what is 
undeniable is that there was a country which contemporaries thought as Ukraina uh, because it was on maps, right? So the Hetmanat uh, of this period was recognized uh, as a state of Ukraine, um, as a country in its own uh, right. Um, the other moment that needs to be stressed is that these uh, this integration of parts of uh, of Ukraine uh, into the Russian Empire comes relatively late in the process of Russian Empire building. And that's important because of the claim of Russian nationalists that, not least the current president, um, that Ukraine always was Russian. Well, it was actually Russian, it became part of the Russian Empire relatively late. Uh, so if you're looking at, so the heartland is around Moscow, right? It first expands to the north and the east, then to the south and the east, then very long into the east, into Siberia, right? And it is relatively late that uh, the Ukrainian lands get added to this. So the notion that uh, it is an integral part of Russia, there is no Russia without Ukraine, is simply historically untrue, right? Um, so the second big moment of, of Ukrainian history is uh, the division of Poland, uh, the, the three divisions of Poland. Um, and I think I have another slide on that. Yeah, we have, but that doesn't actually matter. Oh, sorry. Now I did exactly what you told me not to do. Um, where another, so as uh, the great powers divide Poland, another big chunk of Ukraine comes to Russia, uh, but not all of it. And that's an important part of the history of Ukrainian nation making because Habsburg takes over some of it and the national policies of the Habsburg and of the Tsars and the Romanovs uh, are uh, different uh, in the 19th century. In the 19th century, um, from essentially what is a, a, a cultural raw material um, of uh, people in what we now see as Ukrainians or Ukraine, so linguistic differences, uh, some cultural differences, uh, different sets of political ideas floating around. Um, they get like elsewhere uh, unified into a new sense of nationhood in the 19th century by intellectuals, by, by historians, by linguists, uh, by poets. Um, and uh, and I lost my train of thought because of the phone going off, but that's okay. Um, where was I? Ah, uh, yes, um, the Habsburg Ukraine being important. Um, so, so if we're going back to that to that history um, in Habsburg Ukraine, you could publish in Ukrainian because the national politics there played themselves out differently. In uh, Russian Ukraine, you couldn't. So what did you do? Of course, you published in Habsburg Ukraine and smuggled it back into Russia, right? And so there was a lot of back and forth between intellectuals on the two sides uh, of the border uh, as they were constructing the sense of Ukrainian nationhood in uh, the 19th century. Now, did in the 19th century, all inhabitants who spoke something similar to Ukrainian in the Ukrainian lands think they were Ukrainians? No. Um, they thought of themselves as, um, you know, locals, as peasants, um, uh, as, um, as either Orthodox Christians or Uniate Christians, right? Um, or, of course, they thought of themselves as Poles uh, or as Jews or as Germans or all the other ethnicities which uh, were living in this uh, multinational uh, place. Um, but there was enough sense of that they were different from what was going on in Russia, what they called the Muscovites, right? Um, that during the third important moment in my history, and in my mind, the most important moment, the Ukrainian revolution, there is a distinctly different revolution happening in Ukraine than in Russia. Um, and that is part of another completely convoluted story, which I terribly simplified here, right? 
because what you probably know that moment of uh, the Ukrainian revolution is as some sort of subfield of the Russian revolution. So the Romanov empire, right? A multinational empire where half of the population is not Russian, right? Goes to war and it breaks apart in this war. So there's first one revolution in Petrograd, um, the February revolution, which topples the Tsar. Um, and then there's, of course, the second, uh, the coup of the Bolsheviks, the, the October revolution uh, at the end of the year. That is part of a broader breakdown of the empire. So you get out of, at the end of the war, what you get not is just not just the Russian revolution, the Russian civil war, but you get the wars of the Roman of succession. So in that second box here, I try to just list some of those wars that are going on. The Finnish civil war, probably the most destructive in per capita terms uh, of all of those civil, civil wars is at the top. There are separate civil wars in the Baltics. Uh, in Central Asia, it begins actually earlier than the Russian Revolution. So the empire breaks apart or gets into turmoil in, in the periphery, uh, in the non-European periphery first. Um, you get uh, interstate wars with within that because several um, successor states um, uh, compete over those lands. Um, at some point in 1918, there's something like 32 by memory, uh, governments claiming authority over bits and pieces of that, of that uh, land. Um, and they're all armed uh, more or less and fight each other. So what is often then seen, and, and Poland, of course, is one of those successor states. Um, and Poland is one of the more su successful successor states. So Poland and Bolshevik Russia fight it out, and they fight it out to a significant extent over Ukraine. So what we know as the um, the Soviet-Polish war is really a Soviet-Polish and Ukrainian war uh, that is going on. Um, and so on it goes. So you have a, a conflagration of of revolutions, wars, and civil wars, of which the Russian Revolution is one, and the Russian Revolution is one of the successful ones, right? So out of all of this uh, period of wars and civil wars come out a, a few successor states. The largest, which I listed last here deliberately, is the Soviet Union, or as people mostly called it at the time, Bolshevik Russia, right? which took over nearly all of the old empire by force of arms, right? Mostly by force of arms. Um, they're, conf they're confined on the old, originally on the old Muscovite territories, and then they reconquer much of the old um, empire, except the parts which resist successfully because they're also good state builders. And that is first of all, Poland, of course, the, and the three Baltic uh, states, as well as well as Finland, um, everything else gets taken over. Um, but what gets formed during that time is a first attempt at a modern Ukrainian state. So, as the empire crumbles at the center, we have the revolution in Russia in uh, at the beginning of the year immediately uh, a revolutionary government is formed in Kiev. Um, it calls itself the Central Rada. Rada means council. It's the same word as the Russians use for revolutionary uh, governing bodies. They also call them councils. In Russian, it's called Soviet. So it's a similar thing. It's just two different languages, right? Um, and one of the th many things that Rada does is it, it uh, issues a series of, of, of pronouncements, universals, they call them. And this is an interesting history because this is not just Ukrainians saying, okay, we're now separate, Russia go away, but it's a process of being pushed away by Russia slowly um, into statehood into independence um, because originally what they want is autonomy within a federal Russia. Uh, they want uh, to have more autonomy over their uh, over overrunning their affairs and they want a 
reconstituted empire, a democratic empire uh, with a federative uh, federal structure. The provisional government in Petrograd is not very enthused about that. Um, most of the liberals uh, running Russia are as much imperialists as their monarchic uh, predecessors, but they grudgingly, because they can't control what's going on there, the Russian state is crumbling, right? Uh, they grudgingly accept that you. They, this is the local regional government of Ukraine. Um, then, the Bolsheviks take power um, in a coup, again in Petrograd. And that is one of the steps of radicalization away. It pushes the Rada to declaring independence, declaring uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic. But in that declaration, they still say, but we want to maintain unity with Russia. So there is a continuing attempt to say, we are, we are, we are separate, but united with you, right? Um, and independence only gets declared when push comes to shove, when Bolshevik troops are marching on Kiev. So in the context of war in early 1918 against Bolshevik Russia, um, they declare independence. And then they do something which um, got them very bad press. Um, they went to the Germans for help because the Bolsheviks were militarily stronger. The Germans, of course, had essentially won the war at the Eastern Front at that point and are in negotiations with what's left of the Tsarist Empire, right? Um, so the Rada goes uh, to the Germans and concludes the first Treaty of Brest-Litovsk before the one all of us know about, which is the one between the Bolshevik government and the Germans. And in that treaty, essentially, they get German military protection in exchange for grain, grain exports to Germany. Germany is hungry because it's under blockade, right? Um, German troops then march into Ukraine, occupy it. And then what happens if you invite the Germans in to give you protection? They take over, right? Mm -hmm. So they kick the Rada out uh, because the Rada doesn't do what the Germans want. They want much more punitive extraction of grain and they put in uh, a puppet regime. But that regime of, of uh, Pavel Skoropatsky has, does actually quite a bit of, um, of uh, nation building. Uh, this is where the first Ukrainian university is founded, uh, the Academy of Sciences, and so on and so on. So cultural institutions are founded in a, a great way. What they're not doing is build a good army because the Germans don't let them, while the Bolsheviks are, of course, busy building a good army, and the Poles are too. Then the Germans finally lose the war uh, at the end of 1918 and pull out of Ukraine, and the Ukrainians are alone. They do have an army but it's pretty um, ineffective compared to uh, what the Poles and the, the Bolsheviks have built at that point. Um, so there's then a, a series of uh, post um, Skoropatsky governments, which also importantly then unify uh, this essentially Russian Ukrainian state with a revolutionary Ukrainian state of the Habsburg lands. So the Habsburg Empire also disintegrates and the Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian national movement takes over there as well. And they actually have better troops. So they help a little bit militarily, but that's the first moment when these two parts in modern, uh, in modern uh, history are united. Mm -hmm. And then they get destroyed by essentially a two front war between uh, Bolshevik Russia and um, Ukraine, uh, sorry, and Poland. Um, and that is, you know, piece of Riga is then the division of Ukraine between Poland and Russia. So what happens during what we very often in our kind of Russo-centric view of the world, or 
maybe I shouldn't say ours, mine, I used to have the one I was trained in and nearly everybody of my generation and the two generations before us in my field have been trained in, uh, thought of as the Russian Civil War, was indeed a, a war of Roman of succession where several national projects tried to survive and only a few did. And one imperial project, and that imperial project is the Soviet Union. Um, and much of Ukrainian lands get integrated into, uh, into this new empire, but of course, Poland also takes a good chunk. So again, uh, Ukrainian lands are divided between uh, two states. However, then something really strange happens because you would think that the, the Bolsheviks who are Marxists, Marxists don't like nationalism. They think nationalism is uh, is uh, a kind of way of, of the bourgeoisie of brainwashing the workers. Uh, it will disappear once people understand their true class uh, interests and so on. Um, so they're not friends of uh, nation building processes, but they give Ukraine a state of sorts, right? A fake state, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic within the Soviet Union. This is not something that existed before. The 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 um, uh, the uh, Romanov Empire didn't have a Ukrainian pro province. There were various provinces which covered Ukrainian lands, but there wasn't a Ukrainian province. This was an invention invention of the Bolsheviks. Where only it was an invention, and that I mean that's where some of again the great Russian historian Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin uh, told us that. Ukraine is an invention of the Bolsheviks. It's not an invention of the Bolsheviks, it's the invention of the Ukrainian national movement since the 19th century, which came to its own in the wars of independence after 1917, and which the Bolsheviks felt compelled to accommodate into the Soviet Union because they felt Russian na uh, Ukrainian national sentiment was so strong that you needed to accommodate it. Um, and that means that you have a continuation of statehoods under the Soviet empire from these um, revolutionary wars all the way to 1991. Of course, the borders, and that's the second part of the, well, you know, it's not a real place because its borders change. Most countries change borders over time, right? Um, the borders change and there's several important moment of this border change. Um, one is, um, what happens at the beginning of World War II when um, parts of Poland and uh, Romania are taken over by the Soviet Union and become part of uh, Ukraine. So an eastward expansion essentially taking over the, the bits of real estate Poland had taken in 1921. Um, the other uh, important moment uh, and famous moment, of course, in current uh, um, context is Crimea which is given by um, Khrushchev uh, to Ukraine in 1954 um, because it was it had real deep economic problems and needed to be integrated better into the Soviet Union. And the only way to properly integrate it into anything was to attach it to Ukraine because there's no natural attachment to uh, Russia until Vladimir Vladimirovich built the big bridge, right? So, um, this then is Ukraine as it is existent since 1954 and which becomes independent in 1991. Uh, and there was a, a nice moment when, when uh, um, Putin said, well, if, you know, if they hate us Russians so much, they should give all the stuff uh, they got during the Russian Empire. So these parts, right, and Ukraine and so on. Um, he didn't mention that a bit of what used to be Ukraine uh, was given to Russia too uh, at some point during, uh, through an uh, administrative uh, reshuffle of uh, internal boundaries in the Soviet Union. Okay, so here are the, the kind of the steps of Ukraine's national formation as I see them, uh, following much of the, the historiography uh, on this. Um, the, I have to add here the, the kind of modernist historiography, right? If you would be talking to a medievalist, they probably would make much more of the Rus 
And if you would be talking to an early modernist, they probably would make much more of the uh, of the Hetmanat. Um, but to me, these are quite different entities uh, culturally uh, and politically than what comes into being in the 20th century, which essentially comes out of the national movement of the 19th century, just as other modern nation states like Germany, Italy, France, and so on, which are also constructed during these uh, uh, these periods. So you have the Rush, uh, the Ukrainian um, national awakening in the 19th century. You have the Ukrainian Revolution and wars of independence uh, in during the the wars of the Roman of succession, the division of Ukraine between Poland and Russia in 21, then continuing. Uh, pseudo statehood under the Soviet uh, Union in uh, 1922 to 1991, where Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture very often was uh, promoted. It interspersed then with reactions to that, to what was seen as Ukrainian bourgeois nationalism. Uh, but in between these periods of repression, uh, there was uh, a continuation of um, of uh, of the development of essentially of cultural nation building uh, within there. So that by 1991, many more people thought they were Ukrainians than let's say by 1891, right? A um, hundred years earlier. Um, okay, so then the whole thing breaks apart into the 15 successor states and I'm running uh, quickly out of time so I kind of gave you a potted history of the first two chapters. So I will not give you an equally detailed uh, account of the next ones, uh, but I will run you much quicker through those uh, to get to the present. So there's a few contradictions which exploded in this current war. The first contradiction is between democracy and dictatorship. <laughs> The two countries after 1991, they started with very similar preconditions, right? Uh, with a, an economy which was uh, very uh, strongly still uh, uh, defined by uh, the legacy of the of the Soviet economy, uh, a, a poorly functioning political system, corruption and so on and so on and so on, but they went very different ways. So these two charts here, uh, which are uh, from my book, that's the VDEM index, that's an index of democratic uh, development uh, in a country. And you see Russia is very easy because 1991, and then essentially just goes downhill from there. I mean, there's a little bit of ups and downs, but really it goes downhill. It goes downhill very quickly once Putin becomes president. Uh, and it's been going downhill ever since, really. Uh, Ukraine goes through ups and downs. It, Ukraine goes through uh, moments of democratic revolution and then retrenchment of a new regime after, and then another revolution uh, against it. But overall, as you can see, the, um, the tendency is upward. Um, why this is different, we can maybe talk in the... In the um, uh, in the discussion a little bit. Um, so this is one aspect of this war. Why does Putin want to eliminate Ukraine? Because it's a democratic, it shows that you can be an East Slav and a Democrat. One of the persistent myths the Putin regime tries to sell its own people and the world is that there is a cult because of cultural difference between us and them, you know, you can't have democracy in Russia or our democracy looks different. Namely, it looks like a dictatorship with some elections, right? Um, if you have Ukraine next door and everybody agrees that, you know, they have a lot of cultural similarities, they have a lot of shared history, they can talk to each other very easily, they can understand each other very easily. Um, that's a problem, that argument, right? So that's one contradiction. The other one is decolonization and empire. So essentially both of both Ukraine and Russia are post-imperial states. Um, they are successors of the Soviet empire. 
Ukraine as a former colony could easily embrace post-colonial identity, right? It was a positive thing you could have. It's much more difficult if you are the metropole. It is very, it's not impossible, and there's plenty of anti-imperialist Russians, but it is much harder if you are the metropole to embrace decolonization. You see that in the British sphere of the world as well, right? Um, it becomes particularly difficult if you don't know where the borders of your metropole lie. Uh, if, you know, where is the border? Where's, where's Russia? Where does the, uh, the, where does the empire begin? I remember very strongly debates with thoroughly liberal and democratic Russian friends in the context of the Second Chechen War, who said this is absolutely necessary. If the Chechens go, the next, you know, then the next group of people come. And where will it end? It will just be Moscow. There will be nothing left, right? So it's it. I'm not saying that everybody thought that, but it's it's quite. It requires quite a bit of intellectual and political work to overcome that. And that work, people have tried to do that work, but essentially they 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 uh, um, they lost that battle against neo imperialism, which which uh, uh, capitalized on uh, the very strong residual uh, feelings of resentment that we used to be somebody and now we are not. Um, and I'm nearly done. I know you will start to wave at me because I'm talking about um, None of these things had to lead to war though. You can have, you know, we all live with contradictions all the time. Um, the, the contradiction between the Putin dictatorship and the sometimes troubled Ukrainian democracy was of long standing. There was nothing that triggered that to lead to a war uh, in uh, 2022. There was not a new revolution in Kiev as there had been uh, when the first intervention was when they when they took uh, uh, Crimea and and fostered a proxy war in uh, Donbas. There was nothing triggered that. Um, there was also, I mean, one of my bugbears is the NATO, you know, NATO is to blame uh, story. Uh, it was nothing NATO did at that point either. It was not that Ukraine was about to enter NATO in 2020. Quite the opposite. It was the same thing going on. Yes, behind the horizon, we'll let you in sometime. But as you know from the horizon, if you march towards it, it recedes, right? And the same thing was with the NATO. So NATO was not doing anything that would have triggered this. Uh, and uh, the imperial nostalgia had been going on for a very long time. And most of us, I mean, myself included, thought that was just, you know, domestic kind of propaganda without much. Um, so why did they go to war? Now, my interpretation is what is very often called intentionalist. That is, is focused on the intentions of the decision maker. Um, what made Putin, and there's clear evidence, I think, that everybody was shocked by that decision. Um, everybody in the in the elite, everybody around him even, with the exception of very few people, was shocked by the decision. Why did he make this decision? He had been, um, during the COVID years, he was in isolation, and he had, what had he been doing? And as a history professor, I shouldn't say that, he had been reading history books. And it's sometimes not good for you if that's all you do. And he's been reading Russian imperialist history. And he was steaming in this. And he was thinking there are several moments where he asks historians and journalists, what will what will historians say about me? And they always gave evasive answers because what are going to say? So he was thinking about his legacy. about, And then he published this, what I had the time just thought is completely ridiculous uh, essay on the unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which was the result of that, which is actually not a controversial view among many Russian historians. It's kind of Russian nationalist historiography um, with, the, with the president's name on it in a way. Um, he was thinking about his legacy. He was thinking about Ukraine. He was steaming in his own juices and he was turning 70. I fear it's as simply as that. It's an aging man who is looking for a legacy. 
and he drew his country into the most destructive war since the Great Patriotic War for that reason. And with that, I rest my case. Mark, thank, thank you very much. Um, we've got a roving mic, so to, if you can just state your name and keep it to a brief question, please. I teach it and then Mike. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Very informative as well. Um, just being the devil's advocate for a minute and disregarding the very last bit of your speech, um, I wonder if we can deduce from what you said that Ukraine was a little bit late for catching up with the nationalist movements of the French Revolution at some stage in her history. Um, Ukraine had at least once fought a proxy war in her history prior to this one. And Ukraine may have um, been, a, as you yourself used the word, construct, more of a construct of uh, um, intellectuals. Is there any chance anyone can ever claim that? Um can you just clarify what the proxy war was they were fighting? Um, I believe it was the one between Poland and Russia. Oh, but then they're not fighting a proxy war. They're fighting against both sides. So, um, yeah, but okay. Let's, it sounded like one. But let's let's say Ukraine, Ukraine was late to nationhood and Ukraine is a construct. Yeah, both of that's true. It's also true for Germany, a um, uh, country I grew up in. Um, uh, which was also un also actually divided for, um, I mean, that's the other part, people saying, oh, Ukraine is not a real nation because there's the differences between the East and the West and, and, and so on. And, you know, this German Germany, you know, <laughs> there's differences between the East and West. Um, I'm a Vesi. I, anybody from the East will immediately know that I'm not from where they are from. That doesn't mean that we're not both thinking we're Germans, right? Um, uh, so, yes, it was relatively late, but most nation states were late, actually. I mean, Germany uh, comes into being in, in uh, 1871, right? Okay, that's earlier than Ukraine, but um, but uh, it's not, you know, by historical standards, it's, it's very uh, short term. Um, the construct part, um, yeah, any... Any uh, any human community is a construct in that sense, right? It's not a natural thing that we are together speaking the same language, uh, thinking we're part of a political community. Um, it gets constructed through social intercourse, through learning that you're part of that community, through learning that language, uh, through being indoctrinated in school that you are a part of that. Um, it was, I mean, again, to take the German case, right, it was uh, a, a deliberate nation building process to teach what's called high German to Germans in school that was still ongoing when I went through school, so that the Hicks from where I grew up could talk to the sophisticated people in Hamburg, because we weren't actually talking the same language. So all national communities are constructed in that case, in that sense. Um, the Russian Empire, you know, is also a construct. It wasn't there always. It was built with, you know, fire and sword and so on. And then people were taught that they are citizens of the Tsar. Uh, citizen, no, they were not called citizens. They were subjects of the Tsar. Right? So they also learned that. So, yes, it is relatively late in terms of statehood. That's true. Um, but that is true for a lot of East European uh, states, which come out of uh, the breakdown of the empires, the three big empires in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the same is true, of course, for most, well, all post-colonial nations, most of which only emerge after the Second World War. So it's not, you know, unique in that sense. Uh, for Mr. I've never known how similar are Russian 
and U Ukrainian as languages, and if they're very different, what's the origins of Ukrainian? What language are, uh, group do they come from? Well, there's both. The, I mean, I'm not a linguist, so I'm I'm freelancing here a little bit. But they they um, both are East Slavic languages. Um, they're mutually comprehensible to each other. Um, most Ukrainians are bilingual. Many Ukrainians are actually Russian speakers in the first instance, or were until recently, and they stopped now for obvious reasons. Um, so they're not the same in any way, though. I'm not completely... Uh, I, I can learn languages relatively well, and I my Russian used to be very good, and it was a real hard slog to acquire some basic Ukrainian reading ability. So it's um, my my comparison would be something like I don't know French and Italian. Yeah. Not, yeah. not French, and Italian, French. And Italian. Yeah, we could do either way but um yeah i i mean i'm i'm reluctant to give give a an analogy because i'm not you know, sorry spanish and portuguese okay thank you there's somebody who knows much more about this than i hi professor a uh, quick question how much and if if so how much does demographics play in putin's decision to go to war um in what way? Would in, that... And the, uh, this is his. Own, this is the most fighting age men that he has. It's only going to get worse. Oh, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean that would be a, a reasonable assumption to make. Um, I'm not sure I've seen any evidence of that. But there's another thing which is similar in terms of it's only going to get worse. Because where the whole NATO thing comes in, right, is the perception that there's something brewing there. And the, sim the, the, the analogies he drags out, um, I mean, his great obsession as a historian is the Second World War. And the analogy he, he pulled out at... Um, uh, when when ordering the invasion, uh, the full out invasion twenty two was nineteen forty one. In nineteen forty one, we the Soviet Union should have attacked the Germans and taken them out, um, so they wouldn't attack us. We didn't do that, and we nearly perished. Right in nineteen forty one, and we're in the same situation now because Ukraine is arming and get supported by NATO. And it's true that they were arming and it's true that they got support by NATO because they were trying to defend themselves against the Russian threats, right? They weren't planning to invade, but the sense that it's maybe now or never because also the West is weak, right? Afghanistan, he's watching Afghanistan withdrawal and it just shows a completely incompetent United States, right? Um, and he, he sees, you know, he sees Brexit, he sees EU disunited, NATO disunited. Um, now is a good time to strike. So the, the now or never, and it's possible that the demographics played in that too, because there is an obsession in Russia with the with the demographics as well, that we, we might be dying out. Uh, if you go to war, you might be dying out even quicker, but. So, but yeah, but I don't have any evidence that he was, I mean, we don't have a lot of evidence of his thinking. It's mostly we deduce from his statements, right? And his his writing and so on. Uh, thank you, Professor. My name is Leo and I used to intern here. Uh, I just have a, a very, uh, like, I think it's quite serious, but also hard to answer question. But I think you are, you are a professor in history. Maybe you can... Uh, <laughs> So I searched the Wikipedia, uh, it's quite uh, sad to see, but the, the casualty of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war or conflict uh, is the number, if they come from different sources, they always, mm. not always, but like they most likely are quite different. And um, my question is, how, how could we find out what's the real, or at least close to real, like, facts? 
I mean, a number maybe just. Yeah, it's the truth. I mean, I, I think Piotr has the answer. Do, do you? No. Okay. Um, I thought that was a was. A, um. I don't know. Short short answer. I don't know how we would find out. There are people who dedicate their days and weeks to trying to figure it out, right? Uh, and they can't really. Um, we're probably having a an okay sense of the Russian losses um, insofar as they are visible to the Ukrainians. Um, the Ukrainian losses are classified, right? Um, they are clearly fairly high. And if one goes by the age of people, age of men who are now being trained in the UK, they're running out of young men. It's very frightening, actually. Um, so, so it's bad, I think, the losses. But I, I, I can't give you a number. And I don't know how at this stage we could have, you know, um, reasonable numbers simply because the fog of war is so thick and both sides have have a strong interest in obfuscating what the numbers are because you don't want the enemy to know right um we've got we've got four questions um about four minutes but if we, if we can count up through then um for those in the room just stick around and have a chat anyway please so, yeah. um so my name is jeremy brasington thank you for your excellent talk um it seems to me that Russia's been fearful of the West for a long time. There's probably good reason with the, the Germans twice and the Teutonic Knights and the Poles who were marching across their borders and Stalin absorbed these buffer states in the lead up to the Second World War. And after um, 1991, the, the, the reason for being of NATO was probably somewhat reduced, but they continued to sort of extend their influence towards the East. Do you think he or Russia was motivated at all by that encroachment and that you know the fear of the west that it still exists um well one can of course tell that story in two ways right you you essentially i think told the russian way to tell that story which is we've been invaded there's there's a wonderful 1932 um uh stalin quotation where he identifies with all the all the um the, the history of the Russian Empire and says uh, we have to do my revolution because you know Russia was beaten and was beaten 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 by the Mongols by the Teutonic Knights by the by the Japanese by the Poles you know every beat us because we were backward and now that's why we have to you know um, that's one way to tell the story but of course the other way to tell the story is it's not exactly um defense which built this the largest empire in the world right um it was offense um these are not russian lands siberia was taken from the um the uh, native inhabitants and they were this was one of the most brutal forms of settler colonialism uh in in the history of settler colonialism which uh with strong genocidal aspects Poland was not Russian. They took that over, not because they were attacked by them, right? They divided Poland together with other great powers. So, so it's a very one-sided way to tell that story of one of the most successful imperial powers in the world, right? Until um, 1991, essentially. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not that exact historical memory and that that sense that we are under attack and encircled um that was very strong under for the bolsheviks um stronger for me is the sense that we we should be this should be our backyard we are an empire we are a great power and therefore we should be able to um control this space and the peoples of these countries going west, orienting themselves to Europe, wanting to become NATO members, that is not right because we have a right to them. So that's how I would tell that story um, rather than as a natural reaction because nobody tried to invade Russia at any point. Um, everybody was actually um, committed to the borders as they had emerged in 1991. Okay. Going to squeeze in two more quick ones, Dennis and Michael. 
Mm. Yeah, I don't think I can go there, but he's he's a political, uh, quite a, a political phenomenon. Um, both his initial uh, victory, he was not a very effective uh, politician in peacetime. A lot of the things he tried to do, he didn't do. He was quite unpopular by the time the war broke out, but he clearly found his moment and the country clearly found its leader. It is nearly a Churchill-esque kind of thing, right? So um, not a very great answer, but that's as best I can do it. It's going to get um, one more from Peter. Yeah. Hi, my name is Peter Kuzmin. I'm a Russian-Australian pro-democracy activist. So there is a... Another version of uh, the story is that Putin's decision to go to war with Ukraine was in response to internal mounting internal pressures. Mm. His uh, popularity was steadily declining since uh, 1918, uh, uh, 2018. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, there was a major generational divide that was uh, growing bigger and bigger. So he's the generation that grew up in the Soviet Union, doctrinated in the during the communist times, whereas uh, my generation, people who were born maybe uh, towards the end of the Soviet Union, but then uh, grew up with uh, Western culture and Western education. And um, uh, so the younger population of Russia was is quite different in terms of values, in terms of the worldview, in terms of the attitude towards the West, etc. So his decision to go to war was to basically uh, create this massive divide between Russia and the West. Yeah. Yes, and that might be one way to tell the story about uh, now or never and the, the demography because um, the the generational divide is, is interesting because the your generation is so relatively small um, uh, because of the upheavals uh, of the of the, that that period. Uh, and therefore, the older generations are much more influential. Um, so, in a way, it's also now or never before you know the younger generations grow, take over, and then you know maybe nobody wants to rebuild the Russian Empire. So, I would endorse that. Okay. Well, I think that that brings us to our allotted time. Unfortunately, Mark, thank thank you for covering such thank a you. huge topic in in so much detail, um, giving us such an insight. Thank you all here and online for your interest. Uh, those are dark side. Please stick around, have a glass of wine, and come and buy the book to understand more about what's going on. Mark, thanks very much. Thank you.